Hi, I'm Julie Cooper, a thriller writer and half of the duo bringing you our regular podcast series, Kendall and Cooper Talk Mysteries. Before I turn it over to Wendy, I'd like to say thanks to my brother Chris Squires for his original composition and performance of our theme music titled The Man in the Panama Hat. We're thrilled to introduce our guest author, best-selling New York Times writer of page-turning thrills and nail-biting suspense, Kevin O'Brien. Wendy's decided, after just reading his book called Disturbed, to start calling him Kevin Oh My God Brian, because, well, actually I'll let her tell you about that in just a moment. I know there's a new thriller that's come out, as a matter of fact, so we'll be talking about that also. Welcome, Kevin. Yes, welcome, Kevin. Well, thank you so much, Wendy, Julie, it's so great to hear from both of you. Thanks for having me on the show. This is terrific. This is terrific. Thanks so much for joining us. I know our listeners are really going to get a treat. I'm going to dive right into some questions for you because okay. the, the book of yours that I most recently inhaled over a lock all the doors <laughs> weekend <laughs> was, <laughs> was disturbed. And yes, I was. <laughs> but, <laughs> but in a good way. Wow, your characters and situations feel very realistic. You really ignited my imagination about suspects and motives, and I was surprised how involved I got as a reader, but as if I was living at Willow Tree Court, part of it all, and needing to stop it. How is your writing putting me into the thriller and needing, not just wanting, to figure it all out? Oh, I love that question. I, th- I, I think, at least I like to think, that I develop the characters enough so that the audience has, uh, has identi- they can identify with them, that you've got the reader identification with the main character. Um, in fact, for, that, for that, that particular book, I remember asking, um, I think it was my agent, I said, you know, have you ever had any situations where you're the, the new person on the block and you really feel... Uh, that you don't belong and that everybody's like kind of uh, shunning you. And she said, oh, yeah, she she went to some, I don't know if it was a block party or what it was, but, um, you know, she bought, she baked cookies and she did all this. And and the woman kind of, no one ate her cookies. (laughs) She said, the woman said, who gave the party said, oh, we thought you'd be bringing store-bought cookies or something. And, And it was just one of those it was. It just made her feel rotten, and um, oh, yeah. I think if you can, yeah, and if you can, if you can get the reader involved on that level, just imagine what you can do if this woman's life is being threatened. <laughs> so, <laughs> if you care enough about the about the uh, main characters that that you know something like that just really hits a chord with them, then I think you you've got the reader, you know sympathizing with everything and feeling everything that you want them to feel you know I, I wonder I don't hopefully that makes sense but I hope that answers your question I think it a lot of it has to do with reader identification and and really putting them you know putting them on that block in that woman's in in my heroine's uh, shoes so to speak oh I did I really felt it just moment to moment to moment oh thank you thank you very much some of your primary characters in Disturbed are contemporary older teens in high school, and I found your depictions very realistic, and the parts they played in the story so interesting. What do you like most about writing about this age group today? Well, I I have often have teen hero, heroines and hero, heroes in my books, and I it's because I think... Teenagers just feel everything so vividly. I think everything that happens to them is so dramatic, <laughs> and, <laughs> and uh, you 
know, and I think we never do get out of high school in some ways. I think, you know, you find it your work situation that it's it's not unlike what it was like in high school or or if you've got even as a writer, you know, you have certain cliques and stuff like that within within uh, the writing community. It it's it's interesting. So you really feel I don't think we ever really do get out of high school. So I think everyone can relate to that. So it doesn't have to be like a young adult book. It still can be an adult book with high school characters. And uh, the challenge to that uh, came up recently with one of my uh, my new books, um, Hide Your Fear. Um, I have a 16-year-old girl, and I started to describe her bedroom, and I thought, I have no idea what a 16-year-old girl's bedroom looks like. <laughs> and, and it's good, I, since a man in his 60s who's single shouldn't. Um, but but um, I don't even have all my nieces who've grown up. And uh, so, I, you know, and I'd be basing it on about 20 years ago when they were teenagers. So I actually went to um, Google and um, Googled the modern family teenage girl's room. And uh, that's how I modeled the girl's room in my new book after uh, I forgot the teenage girl's name in Modern Family, but I just used her her bedroom as a blueprint, and, uh, and it, it worked out pretty well, I think. It seemed pretty believable. So there are a little bit of challenges to, you know, to keep up with contemporary teens, but I do love writing about teenagers. Oh, yeah, I think you definitely captured it well, and Thank goodness for Google. What would we all do without yes. it? Yes. <laughs> what did we do before Google? How did we hunt these poor authors? I, I just remember, do you remember? Uh, you're too young for this, Wendy, but we <laughs> had ready reference. Ready reference. You'd call the library and ask for ready reference, and you'd ask a question like, you know, um, who starred in Exodus? <laughs> and they'd be like, and they'd say, one minute, please, and then you'd, you know, about, a few minutes later, you get this, uh, yeah, Exodus started, Paul Newman, Ivory Saint, Sal Minio, and Bob, <laughs> they go through the list, and you knew they were reading it from some reference book that they'd found, and, you know, it was, it was theory back then, and, but it was an actual human being. <laughs> <laughs> so I guess that's what most authors must have done, but they couldn't have written at night like me, so thank God I can just, you know, click onto Google. Oh, that's right. Yeah, you do like to write late at night when it's scary. Yeah. <laughs> yes, it's nice and scary. <laughs> well, thank goodness for librarians. I still do turn to them sometimes. <laughs> oh, I know. I know. In fact, my the current book, uh, Hide Your Fear, the heroine is a librarian. I thought it's about time I salute the librarians. I was, I was told, of course, I had an ulterior motive. I thought they, they'll stock me in all the libraries now. <laughs> <laughs> it's all about me. It's all about sales. <laughs> well, I can't wait to read your new book. I haven't gotten it yet, but I'm looking forward to it so much. Hide your fear. It sounds so oh, scary. You. I know we're going to be talking about that a little bit later. Um, let me ask you first, your villains. They're, they're not concerned about any consequences, it seems. It seems like they're driven to their despicable crimes with a deep passion, though. What's it like to write that kind of twisted passion? Yeah, you have to go into a dark place, I think. You really have to kind of start thinking like uh, this warped, twisted personality thinks. And uh, I have a neighbor who's a psychiatrist, and uh, every time I am outlining a new book and I'm, I'm thinking about my villain and what their motives are, I'll go to him and I'll say, you know, here's what what he's doing and what do you think you know would, would be in his psychological makeup his or her I shouldn't just eliminate uh, just keep it at, at men because I often have women as uh, your, my villains too but, yes you do uh, <laughs> <laughs> well that's right that's right you, I forgot which I know which book you've read now I forgot <laughs> for a second there um, but anyway I, I you know go to him about the motivation what makes a criminal mind kick and he comes up with great stuff. I mean, he'll say, you know, sometimes on the anniversary of an important date in their in their lives is when they act out, or you know, here's why they would, you know, seek revenge. You know, occasionally when I'm still thinking about the motivation behind um, different uh, murders and and crimes that are going on in my books, I will 
I will consider briefly, oh, you know, what if they're doing it for money? And I just think, oh, that's too boring. It's, I, think, I think somebody doing something for money is always, it lacks the passion, uh, I think, that comes from somebody doing something out of revenge or, or the fact that they feel they have a mission to do something, you know, to rid the world of, of the wrong type of women or something, you know, it's like some really awful thing. And, um, you know, a, a villain with a, a mission is always uh, really compelling reading. It, it just makes it, just, you can really get wrapped up in a, into things a lot more than if they're just after money. So, and, uh, you know, in many ways, villains think that they're right in their pursuit. You know, they think that this is, um, you know, this is, they've, they've got a calling and this is what they're doing is, you know, so, so damn the consequences. I'm just going uh, to do what I'm, I'm meant to do in life. And uh, it's, it's creepy thinking. I, I, I sometimes creep myself out when I'm writing this stuff. I'm like, how did I come up with this? Oh, my goodness. <laughs> There's something, like you say, in the deep, dark corners. I wonder, do we all have that something in our deep, dark I, corners? Yes. You know, I think I told you the story before, but I'll tell it to you again. Is I, um, a good friend of mine from uh, the Seattle 7, Jenny Shortridge, asked if I wanted to get my chakra read and my aura cleansed. And I was like, oh, I don't think so. <laughs> I'm not interested <laughs> in that stuff. And she said, well, it's free. It's just a friend of mine who's, you know, looking to get her, you know, her whatever accreditation they have for, for that type of work. And I said, well, okay, sure, if it's free, what the heck. And this woman, um, she, she sat me down in a chair and started waving her hands above my head and around my feet. And, and she said, you have cracks in your feet. And I was like, yeah, really? Okay. Oh. And you're letting, you're letting something in. You're letting spirits in. And I, I see an evil little man that you're working with on something. You you let this evil little man in and be working with something on him. And I said, did Jenny tell you I write thrillers, like scary <laughs> serial killer thrillers? And wow. Said, no, I said, well, I said, I think it's that evil little man working overtime. So <laughs> I, I, <laughs> I, if I if I do creep you out when you're reading my stuff, you, can, you probably can... Uh, give the credit to that evil little man that's working with me. Thank God he doesn't take over. I've got him. I've got him well trained. I get rid of him whenever, <laughs> whenever I'm done at the, whenever I leave the computer. I just okay, goodbye, <laughs> take off, buddy. <laughs> well, that, it sounds like it's the perfect collaboration, and then he's gone. Oh yes, yes, it is. <laughs> what you mean? You have the same things. I'm sure you have. Well, not it's crazy, but <laughs> you, I'm sure you have. We all have our tricks to trying to get. You know, a place we have to be, or things we have to do. I think as writers, we have to we have to fall into some sort of um, a little routine to get us going. You know, each time. Oh, you are right about that. I think you are. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I know I do have to. You're writing rituals. Writing rituals. They get us through it all the time, don't they? It's Well, not all the time, but uh, for me. But, um, yeah, a, a lot of the time. <laughs> <laughs> well, one of my most favorite quotes from one of your characters is this ominous, I knew all your secrets and all your weaknesses. What's your key? Mm. Yeah, what's your key to writing dialogue like that that sticks with the characters and especially with the reader? Oh, I like that question because it it is it's you know what is it the perspiration inspiration you know it is it's uh, the battle sometimes it, you get it right on the mark right when you know you're thinking what are they going to say that's going to really be creepy and <laughs> you, you know for the situation and. And, uh, you know, you get it right on the first mark, but then there's sometimes where you just want to have, you know, just want to really make the hair stand on the back of somebody's neck. <laughs> you want to make them stand up. And um, it just isn't working, and you just have to keep na trying to nail it and get even even down to the... To the articles of that, you know, no, not the, uh, you know, no, you know, just to get the right phrase, it's, it sometimes takes forever. So it, it is funny. It, I think that's the writing game, though. It's the, one of the fascinating things about being a writer is you don't, sometimes you don't know where you get this great idea, and other times you just have to work and work at it until, until the dialogue is perfect. So, um, 
you know, when I when I come if I come up with gems like that, I'm always a little surprised. But and sometimes I'm like, oh, I'm not I'm not surprised. I remember laboring over that for an hour. <laughs> you, know, <so>. <laughs> <laughs> you do have a you work very hard because you have a lot of great quotes like that. I mean, I had trouble oh, I had trouble choosing just one, but they really I just love it. hit the mark. And exactly <laughs> like you said, the hair on the t- back of your neck just oh that's that's oh, tough. Well, your check is in the mail, Wendy. I'll just <laughs> I'll make sure that. <laughs> I know your readers agree with me. Hey, I, I oh, under- thank you. I understand that you're a Hitchcock fan. What do you like most from his work? Well, I, you know, I I got to be a Hitchcock fan because my oldest sister was afraid to take a shower in a, in the house alone. And somebody else had to be in the house. And I couldn't. I never knew what it was about because my my oldest sister seemed pretty tough as nails. I was, I was scared of her, and um, so I I found out it was because of Alfred Hitchcock's Psycho, and there was a murder in the shower and everything. I was, I was about five or six years old at the time, so I was fascinated. I thought I want to find out more about you know this movie and everything else. I knew Hitchcock from from the. TV show back when I was growing up. Right, and, um, right. Alfred Hitchcock Presents. Yeah. And so I would, I got hooked on that, and then I got hooked on all his movies, loved Psycho. And I think of what I love about his movies and appreciate them about, about them now is the fact that outside of a couple of his movies, there's not a lot of bloodshed in his movies. It's all very subtle. And it's, I love that he creates suspense with so many scenes. And and it's not always about shock. It's about uh, building up, slowly building up terror. And I love that. I love that, you know, I, I've often thought of, you know, Tippi Hedren sitting there smoking the cigarette and uh, the birds on, she's on the park bench and you see behind her all the birds are gathering. She doesn't see it. And uh, that's just such great suspense. That's such an example of, of the way Hitchcock works. You know, the, the, the audience knows what the main character doesn't know when you're going out of your... Head, watching, watching them uh, get into more and more danger, and and they are oblivious to it. So I, I love that sort of stuff. Wow, so, I'm thinking of that scene right now. I think it is really memorable because you could just say a few words, and right away I've got that visualized in my head completely. Yeah, I mean it's the way the way he he does that. It's just the the way he it's amazing the way he uh, concocts these scenes, and I mean he's you know, storyboarded them, and uh, I think those images just stick with us. Um, you, well, you and you heard some movie that was made what fifty years or fifty five years ago. Oh my gosh! And it still it still resonates. I think um, because because of the way he just sets these up. You know, it's, it's, I, I'm blown away by him. I, I'm sure. He had his issues as a person, but <laughs> as an artist, he's, he's terrific. So I, I'm, I'm a huge fan of his. So when you're writing, do you also visualize? Or I mean, I know that, like you said, that you're persistent about getting the word choice right. But are you also visualizing in that way? Picture? Oh, yes. Yes, totally. I write like I'm, I write like I'm watching a movie. Um, I I. I hooked on movies when I was a kid, and um, I think that Hitchcock uh, style and everything else that, that sticks in my head when I'm writing, and I often use movies as inspiration, at, you know, when I'm outlining books for the ideas, or for just the mood, and uh, I, I remember, God, I think it was, it might have been this last book, um, when I was outlining it, I thought, okay, I'm just not feeling creepy enough. <laughs> I'm, not, I'm, not, I'm not feeling it. So I have to put in some movie that's going to be really scary and creepy. It was about 1.30 in the morning, and I thought, I'm just going to pop in Silence of the Lambs. And I put, oh. put, put, I put that in, and I turned off the lights, so, you know, get myself in the mood. Yeah. And I'm about halfway through the movie, and I hear right outside my window, I can hear this, Whoa! <laughs> it was like, and I could hear it. It sounded like somebody was being attacked or something like that, or or dying. And uh, I was like, "Oh my god!" <laughs> Whoa! I, I yeah, I finally I it went on for a while. I put the movie on pause and 
went downstairs and found a couple of my neighbors. I live in a condo, and they were all by the front door just saying, yeah, we could hear somebody, too. And I I took a deep breath and said, okay, I'm going to go out there. Oh, <laughs> you know, my gosh. If you, don't, if you don't hear from me in another, you know, 30 seconds, call the police. <laughs> and, um, and by the time I got outside and started looking around, the police had arrived, other people had called, and it was just a drunk guy. It was a teenage boy had gotten drunk and Aww. his friends had abandoned him and he was he was upset but Aww. uh he was in the he was in the alleyway right between uh our building and another and so i got a nice little jolt i, I was inspired that night what can i tell <laughs> you i didn't have to rely on silence of the land that's amazing yeah, I, I think it's amazing how so fast your imagination can just leap right <laughs> oh yes but you know the funny thing is i wasn't alone i like i yeah. came down and all these all these neighbors were down there in their pajamas <laughs> going, what is this? And I was like, I was in the middle of Silence of the Lambs when this started. So. <laughs> That's great. Well, there's a couple of exciting themes that I'm seeing in some of your works, um, the powerful revenge and also the theme of like unintended consequences. What particularly appeals to you about each of those themes? Well, like I said, there's there's nothing like revenge when you're really upset about something that happened and you just won't forget it. I, you know, some of that stuff sticks with you. I, I am, I don't forget a thing. <laughs> anybody, <laughs> you just have to give me the stink eye once, and I'll be like, oh yeah, I remember that guy. He gave me the stink eye, and it'll be like, oh, when did this happen? Oh, 15 years ago. <laughs> <laughs> So there's something about, I don't know, that I can really relate to the revenge idea. I, I don't think I'd ever take a, take revenge on anyone, but, um, yeah. well, I shouldn't say that. I shouldn't say that because, uh, you know, if you give me a nasty review on Amazon, I will kill you in one of my <laughs> books. So, so, in, I, in one of uh, your books, that's great. <laughs> yes, yes. I will, I will, you know, say, they say something like, you know, oh, I don't want to read his books again. I'm like, fine, I'll go ahead and kill you in my next book. I'll just look up your name and change it around and kill you. So, you know, it's very satisfying, let me tell you. There is something really satisfying about revenge. So, um, in fact, a neighbor gave me a T-shirt that says, uh, I think it says something, watch watch out, I might just use you, I might just kill you in my next book or something like that. Oh, I love so, that. <laughs> yeah. No, in fact, uh, my sister had a coworker that she couldn't stand, and um, uh would you kill so-and-so in my book? Uh, sure. So I really, I, <laughs> I had her get beaten up in her apartment. She was a nasty person anyway, so I knew that the reader would be thrilled to see her get her just deserved. She gets beaten up in her apartment and thrown out a window and lands crashing on a BMW. Um, <laughs> oh. All of her windows died. I was going to be chuckling about it, but it was, it was very gratifying because she put my sister through hell. She was a nasty co-worker. Anyway, so yeah, the, revenge. There is something very satisfying about it, and you know, and, and on the reverse side, there's something very satisfying about um, as a reader to to see people get their just desserts. And I think that's why why people read thrillers is to see justice served. You know, so um, you know, they, in, it doesn't happen in real life all the time. You, you know, you, the bad guy sometimes gets away, but um, in in thrillers, you know. For the most part, the villain gets there, so it's it's always it's always very satisfying to see them uh, realize that their whole mission has been, you know, has been an awful one, and that they're that you know they're finally getting their comeuppance. So that is a stuff, good so. point. That's a really good point. Um, when I'm reading, when I'm reading a book, weakness in the victims can be really repelling to me. But in your books, the victims often don't have very much help from, from others. They, they end up having to be self-reliant. So how do you show that strength in your victims? Well, one of, one of my uh, good friends who has read and sort of edited at least the first 100 or 200 pages of my books, and practically every one, she, she's looked at them, she hates wimpy women, <laughs> and ah. so so I can't I can't get away with having too many wimpy wimpy and phony women do not uh, bode well with her. And so she she is always the first to let me know. Oh, I you know I don't like this character. She's not working for me because of you know she's just too much of a wimp. 
Um, so, so that's part of it. I, and also, um, you know, when I'm creating the characters, I have to, I have to um, give them a background which propels the story forward. So if she's from a family of six and uh, they all live around her, it's like, well, why isn't she getting any help? So, <laughs> so I usually have to isolate them. And, you know, she's either estranged from her siblings or, you know, she's an only child or something like that. It, in fact, I, I was talking to a young adult author, Kevin Emerson, and he was saying, yeah, yeah, there's nothing. In these young adult books, the, the parents just, you know, okay, what am I going to do with these parents? How am I going to get rid of them? <laughs> you know, because <laughs> you know, you, there's no adventure if they can rely on their parents. So, you know, um, uh, so it is, it's funny how you have to sometimes isolate your characters and, and, um, and, really play upon their strengths and weaknesses. Uh, it uh, reminds me of, of a story once. With, uh, a same friend of mine who doesn't like wimpy women was <laughs> telling another author that uh, their character wasn't very strong. And so the guy went and made the character a boxer. And I'm like, no, no, that's not what she meant. <laughs> the character didn't have a lot of like motivation or anything else. That inner but, strength. Know, yeah, that inner strength. That didn't have to be somebody with a lot of physical prowess. <laughs> it had to be somebody who had inner strength, exactly. So, yeah, uh, it's funny how, how some some novice writers interpret things. I know another uh, new writer who, who had some characters, and um, and I, I told her, I said, well, you know, I, I really am not getting uh, a feel for this character. So she wrote a biography of them, but it was all like where they went to college, where what they studied, but it had nothing to do with their weaknesses, what, where they felt vulnerable, what they liked, what they didn't like, what they were after. It was all facts <laughs> that oh. really didn't really tell me anything. It was like a resume. Like a, <laughs> a, yeah, and it's like, it, this doesn't tell me a dang thing about the character. So it, it is, it's interesting how, you know, you have to, you have to really know your characters. I don't believe that nonsense about... Uh, you need to know everything that's inside their nightstand drawer, but you should at least know what what motivates them and why they're doing the things they're doing. Oh, that makes a lot of sense. And like you say, sort oh. of the emotions that they have, being able to relate to them emotionally. Right, is, yes. Yeah. yeah, I can see that. Well, um, let me ask you just one more question before we let Julie in here. I know she's okay. chomping at the bit. She's patiently waiting. <laughs> <laughs> I understand that you're involved on the board of the Seattle 7 Writers Organization. Can you tell us a little about that group and your work with the group? Uh, yes, I'm on the board, as you said, and um, it's a terrific organization. It was started by Garth Stein and Jenny Shortridge, two of our best local authors, and they got together uh, every month just to sort of what they called wine and wine. They have wine, and they whine about their editors and their, <laughs> their writing <laughs> things and, what, you know, their, their second draft of this and that. And, and they finally, uh, they, their numbers grew, and they had uh, several other people join them, including Maria Semple, uh, Barty Kirshner, Eric Baumeister, Kara Costello, Costello. And, um, and, you know, they, they finally said, you know, we should be actually, you know, like, make this an organization and do some good for people. And so they started the Seattle 7. And um, it, uh, Kit Baki is also involved in that. And um, she, uh, in fact, she was one of the Seattle 7 back when it was a radical group. <laughs> so so she, <laughs> I, think that, I think that influenced part of the uh, the. Uh, title that they call themselves that. Nice. And they, yeah, is that cool? Nice. And the numbers grew. And what they decided to do is they decided to sort of promote literacy in the Pacific Northwest, promote education in schools, especially writing, uh, and to start pocket libraries for uh, homeless shelters, halfway houses, uh, women's shelters. Uh, places where they really needed books, and so um, this is that's just a, a, a gives you a, sort of a small idea of what we do. Is just to promote writing in the Pacific Northwest, and we also uh, donate our 
signed books to different causes for um, auctions, and, and most of the causes are literary related too. So, uh, and the numbers grew. We now have over 80 members, and um, there's seven still on the board, um, but including the wonderful Lori Frankel is now on the board, and Dave Bowling. Uh, you probably heard of both of them. Definitely. And, uh, Yes, and they're both got wonderful new books out. Well, Lori's is not so new, but it's still selling like crazy. Um, and uh, amongst the members are uh, people like Terry Brooks, uh, Timothy Egan, a Pulitzer Prize winner, another Pulitzer Prize winner, Robert Schenken, who wrote All the Way. Wow. And uh, uh, Heartbreak Ridge and, um, oh, God, in fact, I get that wrong. I think it's Shosh. Shawshank Ridge. Is that it? No. Oh, Oxshaw Ridge. That's it. Uh, which got nominated for Best Picture last year. And, um, oh, Tom Robbins. Uh, oh, Susan Wiggs. Just some wonderful people. Great names. Uh, Fantastic. And, uh, yeah, and it's funny. I referred to there being cliques in the, in the writing community that really aren't. Because I, I have not run into anybody with attitude in this group at yeah. all. None of them. Uh, and it's it's amazing, and the, 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 the people that, um, the, the, the work that's involved in some of these, that some of these writers have, have produced, it's just, it's, it's staggering. It's, you know, they're, they're winning awards right and left. Donna, um, Donna, I'm having a senior moment. Donna, and I'm, I, I can, Donna Muscolty, thank you. I, I knew it would come to me eventually. She's amazing. She's gotten, I don't know how many awards for her, her short story collection, uh, Hello and Goodbye. And, um, yeah, so it's just it, the news that, you know, I, I follow their feeds on Facebook, and um, it's, it's uh, amazing. David B. Williams is another one that's with us. In fact, I'm going to be with him um, at the end of the month at Seward Park at Third Place Books. We're going to do a... Uh, thing on, um, he's going to explain some of the historical significance of some of the places I've murdered people in Seattle. So <laughs> it, should be, it should be kind of fun. It should be kind of a fun little night. And he's, he's actually come up with some creepy locations in Seattle, too, where he thinks it would be terrific for either a murder or a kidnapping to take place. It's, it's all going to be in good fun. So we're going to do that on um, on August 31st at Sword Park, uh, third place book. So oh, great. Place. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. It's, a, it's a great organization. So look us up at www.seattle7writers.org. So check that out. Definitely. Thank you, I definitely will. So, okay, Julie, I know that you've got questions too, so I'm going to let you dive in now. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. Thanks so much, Wendy, and thank you, Julie. What do you got for me, Julie? Well, I have a few questions for you, Kevin. Now, I know you had an atypical approach to your writing career, the start of it, because you worked as a railroad inspector and traveled throughout the western states. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Uh, yes, I was, uh, I was an inspector for the Association of American Railroads uh, starting in 1980 when I moved out to Seattle. And, you know, it puts me in mind of an interview with Lawrence Kasdan, who wrote The Big Chill and Body Heat and several other great movies. And he said, if you want to be a success at a, as a writer or a screenwriter, you should, have a, you should have a parking attendant job. And he said, because you will never fall back on it, you will keep writing. And this railroad job that I had was like my glorified parking attendant job. I, I went from... Uh, Went one freight house to another amongst the Pacific Northwest, uh, checking their records and um, going out in the yards and checking the, the, that they were in compliance with all the regulations uh, that you know are set forth by the Federal Railroad Administration. And um, it was sort of sort of a dull job for me that I had this great aspiration to be a writer, and I. Um, I got to travel all over the Pacific Northwest and meet some interesting people, but it was a great distraction to have, um, to have like a, a book I was writing when I'd be on the road at a Red Lion or a Best Western in Pasco or someplace like that, where there was nothing else to do but sit in your hotel room and write. Um, so it was it was a perfect uh, quote unquote parking attendant job that I had that kept me. Um, 
kept me from starving, and it kept me uh, doing my own writing. And uh, it was great to have that sideline because uh, because the job I did was I was working alone most of the time. So it was it was a terrific uh, job for it. I did it for 17 years. I, I qualified for railroad retirement and uh, quit just in time for that. And um, so I've got that coming to me in a few years. And um, yeah, it was, it was a perfect job for, for that. I was able to quit in 1997 uh, thanks to getting some money from um, for a movie deal. So, yeah, so it was a great, it was a great training ground. Terrific. And it, uh, ironically, every once in a while in my books, someone ends up finding a body, dead body in a railroad yard. So <laughs> one of these uh-huh. days I'm going to write a railroad thriller. I, okay, it will makes happen. perfect I don't sense. know when, but one of these days. All right, we'll be on the lookout for that. Well, yes. what... I think you said the first two of your books that you wrote were really not thrillers. What made you decide, I want to write thrillers? Well, it's, it's really tough to write mainstream books, um, or to sell them, I should say. You know, you can you can write your great, you know, American Catcher in the Rye type of story and stuff, but um, really it's easier to sell in a genre, and so... Um, after my second book sold, it was a real tough sell for my agent. And she said, you know, Kevin, for your next book, why don't you tap into your love for Alfred Hitchcock and try uh, a suspense piece or a thriller? Because thrillers and suspense and mysteries are all hot sellers, and you like it, so why don't you give it a shot? And so I wrote uh, The Next to Die, my first thriller, and it ended up on the USA to Dead bestseller list. So they were like, you found your niche. This, <laughs> let's stick with this. This is, you know, the other books had sold okay, but this one, you know, made, started making Barnes & Noble and New York Times. Now, it didn't make New York Times. I didn't make New York Times for a few more books, but uh, it made the USA to Dead bestseller list. So uh, that, that's what made me uh, stick with it. I don't, now I think I'm, I'm never going back to regular books. It's just always going to be thrillers. Stay with what what wins and what succeeds makes perfect sense. Yes, yes. well, and they, plus I have a sort of a passion for it anyway because of, um, I, I love thrillers, and you can you can address a lot of things that you would want to in a mainstream book in a thriller. You just you know it can be part of the plot, part of the person's background. If if there's something that you really want to explore, you can you can do it through a thriller, especially if you're writing standalones like I do. Um, Absolutely. You know, you can keep changing, uh, you know, the characters and everything else with each new book. So. True. Well, I've got to say, you're such a friendly, outgoing guy, and you look so normal. We know this, Wendy and I, because we spent <laughs> some time with you this this weekend at pretty the normal. summer conference for pretty Pacific normal. Pretty, I mean, we're all the people yes, around, so I had to keep it normal. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> We, we had the opportunity to spend some time and get to know you better um, this weekend over the um, summer conference at Pacific Northwest Writers Association. And and yet, I'm challenged because you come up with these very <laughs> depraved, twisted villains and violent acts and scary events. Where does that come from? Well, in a deep, dark place. It's, it's very funny. I get that from everybody, which is very flattering. I mean, I think people... People read my books and they expect to see somebody looking like Uncle Fester, but you know, it's <laughs> like very scary looking, you know, yes. and stuff. And I'm fairly normal in appearance and all that, and fairly friendly. Um, and you know, it reminds me that my friend Jenny Shortridge, one of my Seattle Seven friends, uh, you know, one to asked me, she said, "Would you like to have your aura cleansed and your your chakra red?" And I was like. What? Well, no, thank you. And she said, well, it's free. And I said, oh, okay, it's free. Sure, sign me up. You know, what the heck? And so um, I went to this person who, who um, you know, had had cleansed Jenny's aura and, and, oh. or read her aura and cleansed her shock or whatever, whichever way you go. You go. And she, yeah. she did a reading for me. And, uh, you know, just very early on in the reading, she, like, waved her hands over my head and over my feet, and at my feet, she said, you know, I am sensing some cracks in your feet, and you are letting some spirits in, and I'm seeing, I'm seeing an evil little man, and you are working <laughs> with this evil little man <laughs> on oh. something. And she said, 
what, you know, does that make any sense to you? And I said, well, that no. evil little man, I think. <laughs> exactly. I said, I think that evil little man is working overtime to help uh, me finish these books. And, and I said, did Jenny tell you that I write thrillers and they're, they're pretty scary plots? And she said, no, no, not at all. And she said, uh, and she said, yeah, she said, well, you've got this little evil man, <laughs> this evil little man trained very well. She said, he's, he's you know, you've got him in control. You just don't let him take over. So <laughs> hopefully he will never take over. He just, he'll just he'll disappear when I need him, I'm hoping. So, uh, I yeah, see. It's, it's, I, if, if I'm, if I, my books are scary, it's all due to the evil little man there. <laughs> That's excellent. Okay, I didn't. <laughs> I did not see that coming. <laughs> you didn't see it coming, did you? <laughs> no, I did not. <laughs> Everybody ought to have an evil little man working overtime and, for them. And the next time we get together, Kevin, I'm going to be staring at your feet. <laughs> <laughs> yep, no sandals here. I'm just always going to keep them covered. <laughs> All right. And, and speaking of evil little men or evil big men and villains, someone mm. once said that villains are just heroes in their own mind. And I wonder if you have a favorite bad guy or bad woman in all the books you've written. Ooh, that's such a good question. Of course, like any smart author, I'm going to try and pick my last book and <laughs> say, you know, the one that's coming out tomorrow. Yeah, that's the one. Uh, sure. I... I I think the, the, there's a character in the book that's coming out tomorrow, Hide Your Fear, who he is abducting teenagers. And uh, it, mostly, well, all of them are swimmers on their swim team in high school. And oh, okay. uh, they've disappeared, and um, only one has been found, and then he was dead, and his naked body washed ashore on, on, uh, near... Uh, I think it was either Lake Wenatchee or the Wenatchee River, one of those things. Anyway, he, his body was found near a riverbank, um, but the rest have just been missing. And uh, it starts out with um, my hero, Aaron, is uh, one of the new missing, and he is being, he's being coached by this guy who thinks he's just this expert coach, and he's sort of just full of himself, and his mission is to train these kids to become great swimmers, and he's kind of sadistic about it. And he, uh, I don't want to give too much away, but yeah. he, he's a man with a mission, and it's, it's really great when Aaron finally <laughs> is able to get free of his clutches, or at least thinks he's free of his clutches, and Aaron tells him off and tells him how sick and twisted he is. And uh, no, I had a great time writing about him. And Sounds like I it. think you're right. They're heroes in their own mind. He thought he was, he thought he was doing some a real good thing here, and he, you know, and and yet, you know, he's the biggest creep around. And of course, um, several of these kids who have gone missing have turned up now, end up turned up bad in the middle of the book. You you find that there's a mass grave someplace. And, okay. Um, oh. Not to be too creepy, but they all, the remains all have swimming medals on there. <laughs> I'm sorry, oh. so creepy, aren't I? They all have swimming yes. medals, and so they've put it together that, yeah, this guy's definitely abducting swimmers and doing something to them. So, um, anyway, oh I shouldn't go on too much. I don't want to give too much away. No, that's, we don't want to do any spoilers plot. on the show. No, no, but it's those details that really twist the knife at the end. I just love those details and the way you do those in your books. <laughs> oh, thank you. Okay, so I know you're a huge fan of Alfred Hitchcock's work, but is there someone else or something else that's been a lasting inspiration for your writing? And it, I'm thinking of a mentor, an old English teacher, um, a writing book that you read that oh, opened God. your eyes. Oh, yes. My, uh, you know, I always wanted to be sort of a writer, and uh, sort of a writer. I like that. I mean, I'm really good at it. Um, <laughs> I always wanted to be a writer. And, and now you is. Do, yeah. I know. <laughs> <laughs> Definitely. <laughs> I is a great writer. And um, I write good. Anyway. Yes. Um, 
I, I took a writing class at Marquette University, and the teacher was an older woman named um, Ann Powers. And as you know, I love my Hitchcock inspiration, and um, Ann was uh, a terrific teacher. She uh, right away told us about the business side of teaching. She didn't tell us how to write. She told us um, that once we wrote what we could do with our writing and what, you know, how you could try and sell it, how you could pitch it, uh, she told us about the writer's market. Just really useful stuff. It wasn't one of these English teachers that's telling you, you know, how to write like Beowulf or something like that. It, it, sure. She really, she really gave you useful information. And she, uh, at one point, she picked out some of her favorite students and had us come to a party at her house and with a bunch of editors and agents, and um, we got to pitch our our story ideas or just talk to these people and get more information about how to get published and stuff. It was, I mean, what a terrific writer, uh, writer and teacher to have in college. At one point, I, I pulled her aside and said, you know, I just want to thank you for being so inspiring. And, um, you know, I don't think I'm really all that good a writer. And she said, no, you are a good writer. And she said, you, you keep writing and you just keep getting better and better. And she said, and your stuff is kind of scary," she said. Yeah. She said, and uh, because I was writing thrillers back then, and this is before I started writing a couple of mainstream. And she said, "You remind me of my friend Robert Block, who you know, I was in a writers group with, my first writers group." And I said, "Robert Block, who wrote Psycho?" Wow. And she, said, she said, "She said yes." And I, 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 from then on, I was like, "Oh my God! No wonder I love this woman." You know, it's like <laughs> so. So it's, it, it, isn't it like it's almost divine inspiration that I ended up, my first teacher was somebody who, you know, who one of her friends was, uh, was you know, wrote one of my favorite books and favorite movies of all time. So, that is really cool. Um, Amazing. Yeah. Amazing. Yeah, she was a great teacher. And, and Kevin, I know you've got a new book launching tomorrow, which you've mentioned the title before, Hide Your Fear. Can you tell us a little bit more about it without including any spoilers for our listeners? Oh, sure. Basically, you heard a little bit about the subplot of Hide Your Fear, which has to do with the disappearance of some teenage swimmers. Swimmers, uh, yes. In the Pacific Northwest. But, yes, but um, the main plot has to do with a woman and her divorcee with three kids um, who has just moved into, pardon me, she's got two kids. The woman with, in my new book has three kids, <laughs> and the one I'm writing, <laughs> this, this woman only has two kids. And they're both young teens, and she's moved into a house on Whidbey Island and has found out that the house, instead of coming with roaches or bad plumbing, has come with a stalker. And there's someone who knows so much about the house, about the conversations they've had. They know all about everything that's going on in her life. And they are starting to stalk her and, um, and send her little creepy emails and other things. And she's, uh, she finds out more and more about the house. And actually, one of the kids discovers a secret room. And that's, I think that's all I'll tell you. Um, but right. the house has a past. The house has a very evil past. And I love writing about contemporary things that mix in with something that happened 20, 30 years ago. And, so, and that's one of my favorite themes. And this you know, I get to write about that in Hide Your Fear. So Great. It's a, well, it's a fun read with lots of creepy moments, and um, there's a whole other subplot going on with these missing teenagers, too. So, But, of course, it all wraps up very well in the end. So. Of course. Well, Hopefully I think you've I already got us hooked. I definitely think you've got us hooked. And, Wendy, I okay. think you've got a segment to, to say as well. Yeah, I think that sounds really creepy, and I'm reserving next weekend for it. <laughs> hey, that's what I like to hear. <laughs> so let me talk a little bit about when one person's ripples in the pond become another person's tidal wave. I mean, aren't mysteries especially such great vehicles for viewing life and human nature? Great fiction like Kevin's can be quite revealing in how the impacts of one person's actions affect many others, whether intended or completely unintended. It's curious how sometimes even the ripples from 
quote, doing the right thing can end up tragically. And so often, in the cruel irony that can be life, the people most adversely affected are those closest to us who we love the most. When I cast my pebbles into the pond by taking some kind of action, whether it's a significant act or it's something just in passing, the ripples spread out from there to touch other people. We can't predict how others will then react. Will they successfully ride the ripples out on top? Will they be pushed into a direction that's positive or has an exciting impact on their lives? That's what we hope for, especially as parents, with how our actions will impact our kids. But sometimes it's not a positive impact. Sometimes a person is hit with a ripple that pulls them under. And in life, as in fiction, that can start a tidal wave that sinks many others, even sinking some innocent people who were just in the right place at the wrong time. As a reader, I follow actions of characters, and as I'm reading, I don't know where the choices they make are going to propel them or the characters around them. But when I look back later in the story, I'll often have an aha moment when I realize those impacts. Have you done that too? Hindsight is twenty twenty in life as well as in fiction. So much of personal destiny is the network of people around us. They're all throwing their pebbles into the pond of life as well. And their ripples are bouncing off others' ripples and also bouncing off the ripples that their own pebbles create. The question in so many books and in life is often whether there exists the self-awareness to break free from the destructive ripples. Do you have the ability within yourself to save yourself? Or can others near you help? And if not, how many will be pulled under with you? Skillful writers like Kevin show the reflection of these actions to us in his writing. We shouldn't be making our life choices out of fear or be paralyzed by indecision. The good we do also pulsates through life as good. The positivity with which we engage the world, the optimism we share, the kindness we express, the service we render, the expressions of gratitude, and all the little compliments we give, the smile, the wave, the nod, our compassion and love and forgiveness all send ripples that soothe and calm and encourage and inspire others that are floating on life's waters too. What do you think about that, Julie? Or are you got something else you're talking about in your segment? Well, I'm actually going in a different, slightly different direction, uh, talking about the dark side, which seems appropriate given who we've been interviewing today. (laughs) Wendy and I give a workshop for writers on the mystery genre, usually for writers' organizations from time to time. And one of the things I talk about for this fiction type is that both writers and readers must expect to deal with darkness whether it's domestic or child abuse, kidnapping, murder, or international terrorism. Depending on the reader's tolerance level, that fictional form may come as a cozy mystery, a graphic forensics-related police procedural, a buckle-your-seat serial killer story, or international espionage. And I wondered, what is there about these kinds of stories, and why do we like them so much? So reading about these kinds of things and experiencing them vicariously gives the reader a scare or a thrill, that's true, but also, according to Lisa Cron and her brilliant book, Story Genius, it allows our brains to perform a dress rehearsal. Functional MRI studies of the human brain show that when you're reading a thriller, a spy novel, or even a fairy tale, your brain activity isn't that of an observer. No, it's the brain activity of a participant. Reading is the chance to say, what would I do in this situation? 
It's really another form of learning, one that encourages and continues to fascinate us. And that's the power of story. It allows us to take a walk on the wild side, experiencing danger, horror, sadness, and yes, even the darkest evil. Something to think about before you start reading that new book by Kevin O'Brien. Are those doors locked? Are you sure? Oh, good. Wait, what was that noise? Hello? Who's there? Kevin, now, oh my God, Brian is there. That's what I'm saying. I know. <laughs> oh, I love hearing that. <laughs> well, for my book recommendation this episode, I have a noir mystery called Follow Her Home by Steph Shaw. Juniper's song would love to be a detective. Now her dear friend asks her for help in a private family investigation, and that's irresistible, especially irresistible when the investigation quickly turns into a mystery. Her friends call her Song, and she's been a Philip Marlowe fan since her 20-something self had first read The Big Sleep at 13. As she says, I savored his words, studied his manners and methods. I carried him with me like an idol. And now she had her own job and client. He was someone I wanted to help. There were only a few of those left. Like Kevin's books, this author keeps the action moving. In this, her debut novel, which went on to become a series. Steph describes herself as the Korean-American feminist noir writer. As her protagonist is driving through L.A.'s side streets, following leads, tailing suspects, it all appeals to Song's romantic ideal of the noir hero. The story takes place over just a weekend. She writes in a modern style that contains elements of the old detective noir. Her writing flows almost rhythmically, and she really knows how to turn a descriptive phase phrase in the most interesting and vivid way. It's all well suited to the background of Los Angeles where the story takes place. Checking on whether her friend's father is having an affair, Song enlists the help of her friends and meets some interesting people along the way, but complications quickly set in and she soon crosses paths with some bad people. Song finds out that when you step out from the fictional pages, you have to keep your wits about you at all times. The author has a fun time drawing detailed similarities between Song and Marlowe. Song certainly has modeled herself after Marlowe as she's grown up. Like Marlowe, she's wisecracking, tough, contemplative, and philosophical, and savors her cigarettes, the camel brand, same as Marlowe. Song comments on what she thinks Marlowe would do throughout most of the action in the book, but then towards the end, her direct references to Marlowe disappear, and she's really on her own. The immersion into Asian culture in L.A. was fascinating, and mostly I enjoyed the very descriptive, detailed writing style with liberal use of interesting metaphors while still keeping a fast-paced read. Julie, what's your recommendation this episode? Well, a surprise. I'm not recommending a book this time. Actually, it's the new TV show based on Charlene Harris's book, called Midnight Texas, a mystery book which then went on to become a series. In a past podcast, I recommended this new mystery series and reviewed this first book written by Charlene Harris. Um, you might recall that she's also the author of the True Blood series of vampire mysteries, which became a very successful TV series on HBO. The first book was called Midnight Texas, logically enough. It's about an odd, very odd, little one stoplight town out in the middle of nowhere, Texas. One that seems to draw residents with unique talents and gifts. Well, if having a talking cat or being a vampire who runs a pawn shop is considered a gift. It's best described as life in a town where being normal is really quite strange. 
This quirky ensemble cast, each with way too many personal secrets, band together to form a sort of family and to solve mysteries. So starting tonight, July 24th, NBC will start airing a new series based on these books. I'm planning to watch and very much hoping that the same kind of understated eccentricity and character development that drew me to her books makes it into the series. However, if it's all flashing fangs, glowing eyes, daggers, and lots of cleavage, I'm out of there. But I'm keeping my fingers crossed. I'm hopeful. And Kevin, do you have a book recommendation for us? Oh, I do. I just finished uh, recently The Spider and the Fly by Claudia Rowe, who is one of the Seattle Seven authors, and she is also a Seattle Times reporter, and uh, she worked for the New York Times as well. And The Spider and the Fly is about um, a reporter who becomes rather fixated and obsessed over finding out what makes a serial killer tick. And uh, she was following the disappearance of several prostitutes in Poughkeepsie. And she was... uh, She found out that this one man was found guilty of it, and he still had... I think most of the bodies were still in the attic of his home. And uh, it's just, it's parts of it, obviously, are very, very uh, uh, creepy and very macabre. And there are some grisly, gruesome details here and there. But uh, it's just such a compelling read because Claudia is a fantastic writer. She's just a beautiful wordsmith. And uh, she gets into, she really doesn't get quite completely into the serial killer's head, but you get so much about her relationship with him, and uh, she starts a correspondence with him while he's in jail, and it's very reminiscent of Truman Capote's In Cold Blood. You find the relationship between the writer and the killer uh, is just fascinating, and she does a great job. She, uh, like I say, she's a fantastic writer, and it's just a very compelling read. I couldn't put it down. So, that's my recommendation. It is based on a true story like In Cold Blood was, and it, like I say, it was very reminiscent of that. And uh, so I think we've got three, well, we've got two great books and a potentially great series that sounds like that we're recommending to people. So I'm glad that I, I got so. a chance. To, I, th- I, think we're, I think we're doing good. I, they better damn well listen to us. That's all I can say. <laughs> so I write these creepy books so they know what's going to happen if they don't listen to us. <laughs> That's right. That's right. Well, I think that's a wrap. We'd like to offer our sincere thanks to Kevin. Thank you so much for joining us today. Oh, thank you for having me. It was really great. I had a fantastic time. And you're the best interviewers here, too. It's terrific. Oh, we had a great time, too. And we really look forward to reading your latest thriller, Hide Your Fear, which launches tomorrow, July 25th. And now we're going to Finish off the show with more music from the man in the Panama hat. Keep reading and keep writing. <laughs>